I'll be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest Together And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see Good evening, everyone. Um, Thank you for joining us this evening. Everyone in the room, those of you online through... um, the YouTube live stream and Facebook live. Welcome to the lung cancer living room uh, from Toronto, Canada. We are so excited to be here. Um, It is our very first time, uh, not only, um, well, it's it's my very first time in Toronto, um, but it's our very first time doing a living room outside of the United States. So we are absolutely thrilled to be doing it here tonight with Dr. Francis Shepard and Dr. Natasha Lail uh, from Pin- Princess Margaret. Um, I, 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 have, I am overwhelmed um, by, by this country and the welcome that we've had here. So thank you all for joining us. Tonight we're going to be talking, um, oh, I should introduce myself. I'm Danielle Hicks. Uh, I'm from GoTo Foundation, and my role there is to oversee all patient support services and programs. So anything and everything that has to do with patient touch, not just in the United States, but globally, is my area of responsibility. So that's, a, that's, that's me. That's who I am. Um, we're going to be talking tonight about two different sort of... Um, we're going to have two different buckets that we're going to be discussing. One is sort of the landscape of lung cancer. What does lung cancer look like today? And then we're going to be talking about what's happening in lung cancer. What's new and exciting? What are some you know cool things coming down the pike that um, are going to be of interest to those living with lung cancer today and those to be you know diagnosed, unfortunately, tomorrow? That's the reality of, uh, of where we are. So uh, with that... I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Shepard and Lael to give us a little introduction of who they are. I'll start. Thank you very much for coming. And for all of you who are out there on the net, welcome as well. Uh, It's too bad you're not here with us in Toronto. Toronto is a hidden gem. Um, So you might even consider coming to visit at some time in the future. I'm a medical oncologist. I treat only lung cancer, so every day of my life I'm treating lung cancer patients, and I've been doing it at uh, Princess Margaret Hospital and the University Health Network for over 40 years now. We have an incredible multidisciplinary team at our hospital. As I say, lung cancer is a team sport. It's not golf. You have to do it as a team, and we have a wonderful team. And one of my best collaborators here is Dr. Lale, and I'll let her introduce herself. Thank you. My name's Natasha Lale. I'm currently the lead of our lung group, which really means that uh, everyone else tells me which direction to go in, and I follow. Uh, I was lucky enough at the start of my uh, cancer career to meet Dr. Shepard, who uh, was very passionate and is still very passionate about lung cancer, and she inspired me to try and follow in her footsteps. It's really been an amazing ride uh, today in clinic. We had a nurse who first worked with me 17 years ago in lung cancer, and she said to me at the end that she was so thrilled to see all of the changes, the targeted therapies, the immune therapy. She said it was so great to see people come in and out with smiles on their faces, to see people working and living longer, better than ever. And uh, I think we, you know, we need to thank also all of our patients who've really helped us get this far. Um, with that, we are going to jump into tonight's presentation. So I'm going to ask Dr. Shepard to come up. 
uh, and we'll get started. So thank you very much. I thought that I would just start with a little overview about lung cancer, an introduction to lung cancer, and some of the challenges that we face in Canada. So some of this may be very specific for Canadians, for those of you who are online and aren't from Canada, but I thought we had to give it a little bit of a maple leaf twist while we're here in Canada. So I'm extremely competitive and I love to be number one. And sadly though, lung cancer is the number one cause of cancer mortality for both men and women. More women get breast cancer, but more women die of lung cancer than breast cancer. Lung cancer is an incredible women's issue, but it has not been taken up by the women as a women's issue. And that's, I think, something that we should be thinking about in the future. More men get prostate cancer, but almost no one dies of prostate cancer. Only 15% of patients die of prostate cancer. And of course, more men, of course, die of lung cancer. So smoking's always the elephant in the room, isn't it? So I always say, smoking's not a sin. We smoke, we drink, we eat too much. There are lots of pleasurable things we do. And for many years, we really didn't know all of the uh, negative effects of smoking. We have learned, but smoking is still with us. And smoking is with us in our youth. And young women smoke as a way to maintain their body image and control their weight. And that's something we really should be addressing. And in case any of you want to ask me about marijuana and lung cancer, I don't know. The answer I usually give is you can smoke 20 or 30 cigarettes a day. I'm not sure you can smoke 20 or 30 joints of marijuana a day and survive. So we just do not have the true data on marijuana. So I will just deflect any potential questions about marijuana right here and now. So what are the types of lung cancer? Non-small cell lung cancer is the big one. And that's broken down into adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and other minor subtypes. They are all associated with smoking. The one that's seen in patients who don't smoke is usually adenocarcinoma. Small cell lung cancer, the most virulent, fast growing of lung cancers, is only about 50% now. And mesothelioma is the cancer of the lining of the lung that is seen in asbestos workers. And, and Canada is a big asbestos country. You know, we have, a, we have a city in Quebec called asbestos. And we have been castigated for still actually producing asbestos and exporting it to the third world. But that now is uh, coming to an end. So let's get back to the smoking issue. And not all lung cancers are seen in smokers. And in particular, women, 20% of women who have lung cancer have never smoked in their lives and really don't have a home exposure or another toxin exposure to understand why they get lung cancer. And then in addition to that, we have 50% of people who that we see that are former smokers. You know, the message got out, smoking's bad for you, they stopped smoking, but it takes 15 years for your risk of lung cancer to come back to that of a non-smoker after you stop smoking. So although that elephant is there in the room with us, we have a large percentage, a significant percentage, considering the numbers of lung cancer, who are never smokers, and half of them are non. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what can I say about this? No one deserves lung cancer. And we do a lot of things that are not healthy. If you're obese, have you ever heard of any physician or any group that would deny insulin or diabetes treatment to obese patients who have diabetes because they are obese? Of course not. Of course not. It is something that really is focused on lung cancer and shouldn't be 
And I just end by saying it again. No one deserves lung cancer, right? So back to lung cancer in general now. Um, we divided a third, a third, a third. Stage one and two, about a third. Stage three, which has spread to the local glands in the center of the chest. And stage four, that has spread outside the chest. Stage one and two, we undertake surgery for cure. But look at those survival curves. You will see that we're only curing about a half of stage two. Stage three, we treat with chemotherapy and radiation of curative intent. And stage four, palliative chemotherapy and now other systemic treatments. And I'll get into the other systemic treatments in a bit. So how can we improve the cure rates for lung cancer? Well, prevention is everything. And we can prevent the majority of lung cancers with smoking cessation. And that's all I'm going to say about that. But I'm just going to focus a little bit, since you brought up the issue Sorry. about <laughs> early detection. Um, mammograms. Is there anyone in this room that doesn't have a mammogram? We've been doing mammograms for years. Larry. Well, yes, Larry. yes, Larry, Larry. Bless your heart, we don't expect you to go for a mammogram. Do you get your PSA checked, Larry? PSA for prostate cancer. Pap smears, with the exception of Larry, everyone in this room has had a million pap smears. Screening for cancer works. It finds cancer early. It finds cancer at a curable stage, and it prevents cancer deaths. And that's been shown for cervix cancer, mm -hmm. for breast cancer, a little bit less for prostate cancer. I just question? want to make a comment because it, you are a million percent right in what you're saying. I know this. I preach this to every choir that will listen when it comes to screening, yet still... I was terrified, and it caused me to kind of look in this different sort of direction about it, right? And I don't know whether that had to do with stigma, whether it had to do with statistics, and how long it's taken for lung cancer to finally be on this upward, you know, sort of climb. I don't know what it was, but I can't drive home enough Dr. Shepard's point and Dr. Lale's point, you, points about screening and how, how Im important it is. So I'm speaking to the women here, Larry, you can cover your ears. You know, having mammograms is horrible. You get your breast squished in this horrible machine. Yet to screen for lung cancer, you would think, well, all you need to do is a chest X-ray. It's easy. It takes a second or two, but chest X-ray screening doesn't work. Here is the PLCO, prostate, lung, and colon uh, lung cancer screening, a uh, uh, cancer screening study that was done in North America, and we did not reduce the death rates or the incidence of lung cancer with chest x ray screening. Chest x ray is too insensitive. By the time you see it on a chest x ray, it is often spread into the nodes. But all that changed with the introduction of computed tomographic screening. And computed tomographic screening has changed miraculously over the last 20 years. And now you can do a whole scan, a spiral CT scan, with one breath hold in the time it takes to do a chest x-ray. You don't even have to do the PA and the lateral. The radiologists tell me it takes more time to get the patient undressed and dressed and positioned yeah. than to do the scan. So where are we with that? The big national lung cancer screening study, we were not allowed to participate. We desperately wanted to participate, but they wouldn't take anyone outside the US. So we set up our own screening program at the Princess Margaret. But look at this, it reduced the number of lung cancer deaths. More lung cancers were found, but the death rate was reduced and the survival was improved by a whopping, whopping 
20%. There is no mammography study that has ever shown a result like that. Well, everyone was blown out of the water. We believed in it. But we needed more proof. So last year at the World Lung, held right here in Toronto, down the street from your hotel, was the Nelson trial. And that was the European equivalent. There are little differences, but I'm not going to get into that. But basically, it was CT screening versus a chest x-ray screening. And look at the absolute difference in lung cancer. These are huge. You can drive a truck through these. You don't need to be a statistician to know that this is clinically meaningful and statistically important. But look at the reduction in lung cancer mortality in women. Lung cancer is a woman's issue. We've got to get the women on board. Do you know that the women's magazines won't advertise about lung cancer. It's not our image. We want to be beautiful. They won't take on lung cancer. But it is a major women's issue. And that's why we've got all these women in the room. We've got women up at the podium. And thank you for coming, Larry. You're not just, you're not just a token. Believe me, you are not just a token. OK? But look at the reduction at eight years, a 60% reduction, 50% at nine years, and 40% at 10 years. That's huge. That's better than mammography, better than PSA screening. And in the Globe and Mail, and I've highlighted, the Globe and Mail is our big national newspaper. Think of it as the New York Times of Canada. Three years ago, last March 2016, three and a half years ago, the Canadian task force recommends CT screening. Somehow or other, it's gone a bit off kilter there. And where are we three and a half years later? Where is the US three and a half years later? Where is the UK three and a half years later? The uptake of CT screening is extremely low. Extremely low among smokers. Why is that? This saves lives. I don't know the answer to why it is. Okay. So the other thing, the immunotherapy tsunami ha is upon us. Now, this started with, um, with melanoma. And it doesn't matter what immune treatment you give melanoma. You can put the bottle beside the bed, and you'll have responders. So I must say, I was a little bit skeptical. I have spent 30 plus years doing immunotherapy trials and have never had a really positive one in lung cancer until recently. And now we have four approved immunotherapy agents. They're being used now first line. We start in advanced disease. They've moved up to first line. They've moved into maintenance therapy to change the cure rate in stage three. And there are four global trials ongoing, almost completed accrual, of adjuvant immunotherapy post-surgery. This will improve the cure rate. But all of this is important and expensive. And we really have to learn and all of us are part of it. The patients are part of it. The doctors are part of it. The government's part of it, particularly in Canada. We have to learn to spend our dollars, our euros, whether they're US dollars or Canadian dollars, wisely. And that's where I was going to end in the space of a mere 10 minutes originally. <laughs> so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk a bit about some of what is coming to prime time, some of what, in my opinion, should be prime time, some things you might want to ask about if your loved one has lung cancer, uh, as well as a bit about the research that we're doing, largely supported through our foundation and our scientists, um, including a slide of research that Larry's very interested in. So talk, talk a bit about those. 
So Dr. Shepard's done a really great job explaining about how in lung cancer we've had this real revolution where if you have one of these gene targets in your cancer and you hit it, you do so much better in the blue line than if we don't find it or we don't hit it with the right kind of treatment in the green line. And I think we all agree, you know, even this with people living years isn't good enough. You know, we really want all of our patients with stage four disease to be up here. And that's where we need to go in the next five years. But even if you do have a smoking history and you don't have one of these gene targets, you know, we've really had an amazing revolution with immune therapy. We do have some markers of sensitivity. And again, just like the targeted therapy, if you've got these different markers, you can do so much better even just with one simple drug than with chemotherapy. And again, you know, we want this line to be up here and that's where we need to go in the next couple of years. So it's been great. Dr. Shepard's talked about how, you know, it's, it, there's just been this explosion in drug development. There's been this explosion in investment in lung cancer, which has really been wonderful for all of us. Uh, these are some of the targets. There's a new target every year. These are some of the drugs. Every there are day. several new drugs uh, that, that are here. Uh, and, and we're learning that lung cancer, you know, we've thought of it as sort of the most common, you know, this huge entity. But in fact, it is very, very, very many different small pockets of disease, very, very many rare cancers. And that really changes how we need to approach it. So a lot of what we've been trying to do at the Princess Margaret is make sure that we understand targets and that we are able for, to make sure that our patients access treatments. And so you go from the level of your genes or your DNA, you make protein from that, something called RNA, which helps you transcribe your proteins. And your proteins really perform all of the functions of, of your, your daily cellular functions. So whether it's a cancer cell that needs these proteins to grow and spread, or whether it's normal cells or tumor suppressors that, uh, that really prevent or protect you from cancer. So in Canada, around now across the country, you know, it's taken us about 10 or 15 years to get two genes very reliably tested, and more recently the immunotherapy protein, so three things. And yet the truth is that there are probably about nine or 10 things that we need to be testing for in everyone's cancer. And so part of what we've done is we've been trying to bring this new technology to patients, thanks to our foundation, and we found that when we use the technology, and we don't just limit ourselves to three genes, we can actually find new therapies for up to 70% of people. So that can really make a huge difference. And part of what we're doing is trying to build that business case and convince government that this is something really important that they need to invest in this for all of our lung cancer patients across Canada. The, the other thing that's so interesting, you know, in breast cancer and colon cancer, people often have surgery, you know, I don't mean to be gross, but there are sort of large chunks of tumor floating around in pathology departments in lung cancer. You know, there's a very famous pathologist called uh, Two Cell Tau, and he vowed that he could diagnose anything with two cells. But the problem is, I can't find all these abnormalities with two cells. And it's also really hard to get these big chunks of tumor unless somebody's had surgery. So liquid biopsies or finding some of the broken down material or genetic material in blood has really made a tremendous difference in lung cancer. We know that up to 40% of people don't have enough tissue for all of the extended testing we want to do. And so if you could just do a blood test, that would make a huge difference. And it's really changed. You know, we've initially worked on looking at, you know, if treatments stop working, can we make some diagnoses and change people's treatments? I'll show you some slides on that. Uh, more recently, we've been working at the level of diagnosis. So if we don't have enough tissue, do I really need to ask you to do a new biopsy? Or can I just do a blood test and we can make all of our decisions from there? I think that those are really prime time or should be in Canada. And even in earlier stage disease, if you have a nodule from screening, can we do a blood test to figure out if it's cancer or not? Can we look at someone where we're not sure about the CT scan or not even sure if they need to have one? And can blood help us inform what we do? And so, for example, um, I'll have a patient where we don't have enough tissue for all of the markers. We do a blood test. It shows me the marker that's relevant. And then the pathologist can go back and say, okay, I can't do all of the markers, but I can do one. And I'm going to do that one that you found in blood. And that suddenly opens up a whole range of possibilities for people. So, you know, I think we've really learned a lot about, you know, blood tests, informing tissue tests and vice versa. So this is a study that we participated in that I think really is bringing blood testing into the prime time, where we found that if you looked in a person's tissue biopsy or in their blood test, 
by and large, there was a lot of overlap. You found most things by either method, most abnormalities by either method. And in fact, we found more in blood. So in fact, you could do blood tests first and save tissue testing for later. And I think that could make a really big difference. Um, my personal bias is I think this is ready for prime time. I'm ready if I find something in blood to go ahead and offer somebody treatment based on that. Um, my pathology colleagues are perhaps not as ready as I am, uh, but you know I think, I think this is where we're going in the next one to two years. So is it the same here, sorry. <laughs> is it the same here where um, in the US, tissue still sort of the gold standard, yes. obviously, right? Yes. But in the US, if we see it in the blood, then we know it's there. If we don't see it in the blood, we're not sure it's not. That's what, that's kind of, yeah. so it's the same kind of. It's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and although I think that uh, we have been a little less trusting, particularly being able to get patients access to trials, yeah. you know, the tissue still remains the gold standard and we're hoping that that will shift and blood will become an acceptable alternative. So, you know, it's interesting if you look at the example of, you know, one of the things we learned about, first I thought, you know, there's small cell and then there's not small cell lung cancer or non-small cell. Now I'm learning that there are different specific genomic subtypes. And now I'm learning that a person's cancer doesn't even stay the same over their lifetime. So it used to be that if you had one cancer, you know, why on earth would you repeat the biopsy a year or two later? It's going to be the same cancer. But now we've learned that's actually not the case and that things change. And so, you know, if you're on a drug that kills off the blue, the green cells, you might have this one red cell that hides, you go into a remission or you're doing very well, and then suddenly over time it slowly grows and you have this resistance, but it's not the same as the resistance from the green cells. And so this idea that you need to keep repeating the sampling or keep get, continually getting that real-time snapshot of somebody's molecular profile of their cancer is so important. You're not pin cushions. You can't keep doing biopsies every five minutes or every six months. And so I think this is where blood-based testing really will help us make life so much better for people with lung and other cancers. And so we've really put this into practice with EGFR positive cancer. We led a large Canadian uh, wide study where over uh, at four different centers, we were able to get patients across the country uh, to send both their blood and their tissue in. And we found that instead of biopsying somebody, just like in the US, like you mentioned, you could do the blood test first. If we found the marker we, we were looking for, we could change the treatment. And if we didn't find it, then we could ask people to go onto a biopsy. We were able to decrease the number of biopsies by 60%, save money, save time, save needles. And so it's, it's really made a huge difference. And currently the government is considering this work for funding. Go ahead. Can I go back to my Dr. Lynn? Sure. Did I hear you say that I might be ALK positive and ALK positive now, but there could be something hiding somewhere else that we could discover? The, the slide before this one? Back. Yes. Is that yes. what you just said? It, it is, and I'll show you a, an ALK specific slide as well, okay. just so you can get a sense. And how um, often would we, we be tested for that? So, and I think that this is emerging. So right. for example, people with EGFR positive disease or ALK positive disease, you know, this blood-based testing is, is really, becoming an accepted standard. Um, and maybe what I'll do is I'll move off for this. You know, one of the questions always is, you know, can you follow levels in blood and change treatment based on that? You know, this is an example of a patient we've been following. Dr. Liu at our program has been, has been collecting blood on patients with on different treatments. And in the orange box, you can see a growing number of lines there. That means there's sort of an emerging number of mutations. And a few months later, that patient actually developed growth on their scans and we needed to change therapy. And, and what we found in blood actually predicted what we found on the biopsy. And so sometimes blood can be used as an alternative to direct therapy. This is someone who had a, a different drug than you did. They had crizotinib. And in the blood, you can see that their original abnormality is still there, that EML4 ALK fusion, but now they had new abnormalities and new resistance mutations. And so based on that, you can say, okay, what drug would I have that could target all three of these? Just something, just a note of caution. You know, it's really nice that all of these companies tell you what drugs to be on or tell you what trials to be on. The truth is that's not always true. And you really do need to talk to your doctor to understand, okay, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. What do they say is approved, but it actually doesn't work in my cancer. You know, you do need to have that conversation. These aren't, uh, they're not yet ready for direct to consumer marketing. Um, Thank you. It's just funny that sometimes I absorb things when I need them, and I didn't know about this until just now, so thank you. And I, and I promise you, I, I hope you and I don't need to talk about blood-based testing for years and years, yes. but when we do, yeah. we will. And so, you know, with those different abnormalities that we find, whether it's in blood or in tissue, 
can we then go to like a map like this and say, okay, you know, we've got one, we've got two, we've got three, what's all green here? And can we use that to help really personalize therapy even better? And so with this explosion of new drugs that are all slightly different, we're hoping that that's the way we're going in even less than five years. So part of what we're doing, again, similar to the tissue testing, we're trying to really prove that this is value added. So we've got a study uh, that we started at the Princess Margaret and we've expanded across Canada. It's called the value study where people get their blood-based testing, whether it's before they start therapy or if treatment's not working anymore, we get a result in about six or seven days based on the blood. And then we're trying to show how much that really adds. And so again, this idea that, you know, it's not just for those who can pay or who have the coverage, but for all Canadians. So what are some of our challenges? And so, you know, when we struggle in clinic, you know, the things are, okay, so we know the target, we know the treatment, but there's a small number of people where it still doesn't work, so why is that? And so how do we discover how to overcome that? We know the target, we know the treatments, it's working brilliantly for years, but then it stops. So what is it? Is it the red cell? You know, what is that emerging element of resistance? We know the target. We, we know it's important. We don't yet have a therapy, so how do we find one? And that's some of the research that we also do. And then we, we have no idea. We can't find any of our known targets. We don't know why this person has lung cancer. We don't know what it would be most sensitive to. And these, you know, areas where we need more discovery, you know, we're really kind of stuck with things like chemotherapy. So a lot of what we've done in Dr. Shepard's pioneered this program with Dr. Ming Chow. It's been going for over 20 years, I think, uh, is this idea that you could take cancer samples from people and you could, you could grow them elsewhere and make it much easier to test, much harder to put you on trials and make you go through all the treatments. Could we do this elsewhere? And so, so xenografts would, for example, be other living models or animal models. I apologize to all the PETA followers. Please forgive me. Um, but, you know, the Princess Margaret has one of the largest collections in the world of different types of lung cancer. And Dr. Shepard and Dr. Chow and the whole team, we look at how we've been able to recreate a person's tumor in that model. And then you can actually do testing and you can figure out what, uh, what, what treatments would work, what wouldn't, and if it doesn't, why not? And so you're able to get a lot of the tumor tissue without going back to the patient and poking them for, uh, for different samples. Uh, Dr. Liu, for example, has a, a, a large grant from the Canadian uh, Cancer Society Research Institute where we look at people with easier firing out positive lung cancer. We're able to grow out these tumors and test them to try and get ahead of the tumor, so to speak, so that we can predict what's going to happen next and help pick up therapy. And this has actually been great. We've got an interesting publication coming out looking at some of the novel mechanisms of why things stop working. And so, you know, we're really excited about, about these and other studies. And so, you know, to carry that work one step further, with Dr. Chow and the team, we've been looking at how do we make this faster, better, cheaper, it's very Canadian. Um, but again, you know, how do we really accelerate things if with the mouse work at six to 12 months, how do we make it one to three? And so now we're starting to grow tumors in basically pots of jelly where we can do the same thing. We can do the drug testing, we can look at sensitivities. And so this is some work that uh, we're, we're working on with Dr. Chow. Again, this idea that, you know, maybe we can make things even faster and speed it up even more to help, help all of us understand more about, about an individual person's tumor. And then some of the other ways that we're trying to think about these challenges, you know, sometimes we know the targets, we know the genes that are out there, we've read the scientific journals, we've found it in our own patients, but we don't have good drugs, despite that very, very long list that I showed earlier. So we're starting to work with scientists now to ask, well, how do we figure out, you know, these proteins are important to person X's cancer, can we do drug screens to look at any other potential drugs? You know, maybe there are drugs out there that are not developed by pharmaceutical companies, you know, maybe there are vitamins or nutraceuticals, different things. And so we're currently embarking in a, in a series of drug screening technology tests to try and see if we can really start matching up drugs where a person has a target, but we don't have a known therapy for it yet. So that's work that we're currently um, developing and we're doing some fundraising for. Does that include like the, some drugs sitting on shelves never been used? Yes. Yes, so or some of these some libraries old are drugs huge. being repurposed. Mm -hmm. Repurposed, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this slide is for Larry. Uh, so one of the other things, you know, I talked about sort of going from the gene to the protein, and there's that sort of messaging system. You get some copies, and then you build protein out of that. And, and we know that not all of your genes work all of the time. We know that your body can turn genes on and off because you need different functions at different times. Um, and some of the ways it does that is something called methylation. You'll probably have heard a bit about that where basically, you know, if your gene is working, you can see here, uh, there are very few of these, we call them CPG islands or sort of methylation spots. Most of these spots here are white. 
but if there is a lot of methylation, you can actually turn off or silence the gene. And you can see that here. And so, you know, we've learned that some cancers are under methylated, so things are turned on, and some cancers are hyper or over methylated, so a lot of things are turned off, in particular, the genes that protect you from cancer. And what's interesting in some of the work that we've done, we just published this earlier this year, you can see those little gray dots. So that's actually from blood tests. So we actually didn't have to use tumor samples. This is from blood tests that we were able to collect from patients with lung cancer. And you can see how the gray dots don't really overlap with any of the other colors, which is all other different types of cancer. So pancreas cancer, esophagus, head and neck, um, gynecologic cancers. And so clearly there's this signature or this specific set of genes that are turned off or on in lung cancer Building on that, Dr. Shepard's doing some exciting work trying to figure out, well, if we know there's a specific signature, can we say, you know, you've got signature X or you've got signature Y, therefore you're at higher risk, for example, of spread to brain. My team's also doing some research looking at whether, you know, based on these signatures and how they look and change over time, can I predict what mutations you'll have and can I predict what treatments will work for you? And so, you know, there's a lot of interest in this as an alternate way of figuring out um, drug sensitivity and, and treatments. Immunotherapy is very exciting. We can vaccinate people. We can enhance your immune system's response, so your T and B cells or those, those cells in the immune system that would go out and kill a cancer. Um, you know, how do we make sure that the cancer can't turn those off? Uh, and drugs are one way, so there are these um, immune therapy or checkpoint inhibitors that a lot of people have been on, have been very exciting, either by themselves or adding chemotherapy to them. But some of the other things that we're doing at the Princess Margaret is we can actually take a person's tumor, take those T cells or those, uh, those um, immune cells that would attack a cancer out, grow them up in a laboratory, and then actually give them back to a patient as part of a it's, a, it's like a, having a, a stem cell transplant. And so we've actually got some trials at the Princess Margaret uh, in several cancers, including uh, lung cancer, but also mesothelioma. We're doing some very exciting work where we're actually doing this. So whether it's uh, engineered T cells uh, or whether we take a person's, the person's own T cells and grow them out and give them back to try and improve uh, cancer, cancer sensitivity. So these are some of the things that, uh, that we're doing at the Princess Margaret. And of course the goal is you know, this is where we were. Dr. Shepard in her early years got us from the, the black line to the blue line. More recently, we've moved up to, you know, immune therapy uh, with things getting even higher. And of course, we want that straight line with people, uh, people being cured. And so I think we're slowly making progress uh, towards that. And of course, we need that to be faster. So part of how we do that, of course, are through trials, both our profiling and, uh, and uh, some of our other testing programs are through trials. Uh, we're very lucky to partner with Lung Cancer Canada, so we send out a blast every, every month about the different trials that we have. Uh, also, a lot of the work that we do is through the foundation. Um, as you know, research money, especially for uh, lung cancer, is very hard to come by. And so we've been very grateful to have a number of donors, often our patients. Francis Dr. Shepard's actually raised over $10 million, I think, for lung cancer research uh, with the foundation. And so, um, you know, if, if you want to learn the endowed That's money. Endowed. So if you want to learn more about that, we'd certainly encourage you to, to contact Malka here uh, from our foundation. And so with that, uh, I hope Dr. Shepard and I have convinced you that we've made a lot of progress. Obviously, we still need to make more to overcome resistance, to prevent acquired resistance. But I think we're really coming a long way to figuring out what the right treatment is for the right person at the right time. And of course, that Canadian twist to get it for the right price. <laughs> a huge, huge, huge thank you um, to Drs. Shepard and Lael. I, I was absolutely fascinated by this conversation. I know we got a little kind of off track, but that's kind of what, how the, the living room works. It's meant to be organic and kind of flow based on the questions asked, and in spite of the fact that I hijacked a lot of the questions. Um, You're um, I, I know, right? I think, I think it was spectacular. So huge, huge thank you. Uh, to both of you for coming out and talking with us tonight. Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family 
Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight, but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest like sailors in a tempest together and it could be just you and me we'll be family just wait and see